This is our first ever the webinar be under the brand name Tacticon Talks, and I hope it will be well received. Uh, we will talk about statistics and trends, especially for the Benelux region. My name is Anna-Marie Gubanski, and I'm co-owner of Tacticon, which is a consultancy specialized in revenue management, offering revenue management outsourcing and tech tech investigations. With over 100 properties all over Europe, we are one of the main revenue management consultancies in Europe. Now, Tactical is the organizer behind Revenue Forum, uh, the webinars and seminars, uh, as well as the largest event in Europe, Global Revenue Forum. I will tell more about this at the end of this uh, webinar, but let's start focusing on, on the topic of today. Maybe let's introduce the next speaker, Samantha. Joel Marie, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity as well to present uh, you with SDR's latest market data today. Uh, for those of you who on the line don't know who SDR is, we are a global hospitality data and benchmarking provider. Uh, and since 2019, we form part of the Coastal Group. Um, oh, sorry, and I completely forgot to introduce myself. Uh, so my name is, uh, is Samantha Martka, and I am Regional Manager for Northern and Western Europe here at STR. Thank you, Tim so shall I Shall I take over, or is Tim there? No, Tim, sorry. Uh, Tim, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm still muted. Uh, my name is Tim Boersma. I'm revenue and sales manager for the Benelux market of Room Price Genie. And within Room Price Genie, we provide hotels with a revenue management system. Hello, so my name is Pascal Schubert. I'm VP Business Development at The Edge. Um, I The Edge is a global company, you know, offering hospitality tech solutions related to the online distribution. So voila. Good morning. My name is Andre Kaufman. I'm um, looking after Mia for Trustio. Trustio is the largest guest feedback platform in the world. And then today's session, we're going to have a look on the impact of reviews on booking behavior uh, for the region. Good morning. My name is Olivier Dapper, uh, business development manager for Guestline, uh, an English PMS uh, program. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, the Benelux market, uh, and it's a pleasure that I can tell you something about the self-service guest journey uh, this morning. Looking forward to it. It's going to be an exciting hour, I think. Let's go to the first speaker, Samantha. Samantha, are you ready? Um, so as I was saying before, STR is a global hotel data and benchmarking provider. Uh, we are now part of the, the CoStar group since 2019. Uh, CoStar is a commercial real estate platform um, specialized in anything commercial real estate. And the hospitality sector um, was the, the latest addition to, to their acquisitions back at the end of 2019. So as STR... We report on uh, nearly 80,000 hotels globally, which represent just about 10 million rooms uh, performance. We even have hotels reporting data to us in Greenland. <laughs> and therefore, our presence is really, truly global. But today, our focus will be looking at performance of hotels in the Benelux with a short overview of the world as well as Europe. Um, we will be touching on historical performance, but we will also look at uh, the future and what future demand looks like. The questions that we will try to answer while we travel through the data today are, first of all, when will international demand fully return? How and when will economic uncertainty impact trading? Is the recovery between luxury and economy still tiered? urban versus leisure destinations? Is there still a fork in the road? And finally, what is the new normal for travel demand? So globally, hotel occupancies will have practically reached full recovery against their performance between January to August 2019. Some market occupancy levels will have even surpassed 
those of four years ago, like uh, the Middle East or Central America, while Australia and Asia just need this last little push to catch up with the rest of the world. Airlines will have also recovered on capacity, which will stimulate further demand into 2023 and beyond. And if you look at week 37, uh, which falls just about here um, on the graph, you will notice that that week represents the tipping point where airlines capacities matches that of 2019. The only reason for the dotted line dropping again after that is purely because airlines have not yet communicated their full flight schedules to the end of this year. Of course, the other elephant in the room uh, for international travel demands is the return of Chinese travel due to prolongated travel restrictions in that part of the world and the delay on travel visas. Europe will have to just wait a little bit longer to see the full impact of Chinese travelers, which once they return should account for about 250 million room nights by end of 2024 and 350 million the following year. In terms of pricing, uh, no more catching up to be done. On the contrary, all world regions except for China have experienced double digit ADR growth compared to the same period in 2019. This growth was of course impacted by growing inflation, but also by the rise in global travel demand led by the initial revenge travel of the second half of 2021. Looking at Europe, patterns aren't much different than worldwide. RevPAR growth was dominated by growth in ADR starting from early last year. And while the change in percentage um, was at its peak in Q1 of this year, with RevPAR reaching nearly 90% growth over January 2022, the normalization in travel demands change also has its impact on the numbers. You can notice that all three KPIs, sorry, all three KPIs are moving towards smaller percentage growth as we progress further into 2023. When looking at the recovery numbers half a year ago, the class segment that would have stood out from the rest of, uh, of, of the other class segments was luxury. But that divide is becoming smaller now as well. An economy is actually catching up with both a growth in occupancy, but more importantly, also a growth in ADR. Gateway cities across Europe have practically all recovered, if not even surpassed their 2019 performance year to date. And while Europe may not see the return of China just yet, it is certainly feeling the impact of Americans traveling outside of US borders. As you will notice from this slide, the number of Americans traveling internationally compared to what they used to in 2019 is far greater than the number of non-US citizens traveling to the US. That is in part thanks to the strong dollar exchange rates against the Euro and the, the pound. Those European markets who were receiving an important share of US travelers back in 2019 can expect to see a nice increase in their hotels this year. In fact, nearly 20% of Parisian hotels in 2023 um, are due to be occupied by American tourists. Um, and that is data that we are receiving through tourism economics. Uh, topped up, of course, by the influx of Middle Eastern travelers looking for an alternative destination for tax-free shopping. So how has the, the Benelux performed in all of that? Well, overall, from an occupancy perspective, things have greatly improved against same time last year. And compared to 2019 year to date, Benelux markets are just a few percentage points away from being fully recovered. The only outlier here is really just Luxembourg who is still uh, uh, lagging just a little bit behind the rest. Rate-wise, Double-digit growth across the board, around 20 percentage score. So that is uh, following nicely after a global performance as well as Europe's. And when looking at 
travel patterns. The one market that stands out for me here is without a doubt Brussels. Brussels has historically been a market much more focused on corporate travel, specifically on the midweek. But this year has seen a shift in demand and weekends are actually surpassing weekdays for the first time, if not ever. On the other hand, while the majority of Benelux markets have driven higher rates over weekends than midweek, Brussels' focus on ADR was still centered towards that core midweek demand. Let's have a, seg um, a look at how segmentation is faring in the Netherlands. While we can determine ever so few growth patterns in group demand throughout 2023, the pattern across all three segments is pretty much similar and just below the occupancy of 2019. Weekends have taken the lead on occupancy recovery across the country, while weekdays remain the laggard. But from an ADR point of view, across the week, we can see good growth overall. The first quarter of 2023 in Amsterdam has experienced quite a high jump in occupancy level since Q1 last year, uh, while still bearing the consequences of partial lockdown measures. This growth did stabilize, though, further throughout 2023. And again, similar to all other patterns we've seen earlier, ADR for Amsterdam as well has grown by double digits in all segments. Belgian segmentation data isn't that different to the Dutch, uh, although it is just a bit further away from recovery versus 2019. But here as well, we can recognize certain dates where an influx in group demand took place. For Belgium, this is specifically visible over the second half of July when Tomorrowland was taking place. And then from a day of week perspective, weekend demand, as we've seen earlier, still has the upper hand over the midweek. From a rate growth perspective now again, weekends are performing 30 to even 50% higher than midweek. As for Brussels, occupancy growth dropped slightly over the summer months in the upper upscale and luxury segments, while still maintaining a very good growth performance overall. Uh, this drop is only in respect to percentage increase against the same period last year. Here as well, the upper upscale and luxury class hotels are those experiencing a slightly faded rate growth in ADR, while the economy and mid-scale segments were pacing faster. And now finally looking at Luxembourg, which is running a bit behind its neighbors in the recovery from COVID, um, but it is still seeing a positive occupancy performance in 2023 and is around 10 percentage points away from 2019. While maintaining a similar trend as the rest of Europe in ADR, with growth surpassing the 30 to 40% increase over the weekends. Looking at the year ahead of us now, what we can determine from this graph, um, and these are reservations made for the next 365 days of the year, Rotterdam in light blue is clearly showing strong compression throughout the remainder of 2023 and even into 2024. Same goes for Antwerp, by the way, which is the yellow line. Amsterdam continues to surpass the numbers which were recorded on the books same time last year. And a very similar pattern is visible in Brussels as well. So in conclusion for today, um, the world has seen record-breaking ADR performance. All that's left is just that little percentage on uh, recovery of occupancy. ADR growth has faded and will continue to normalize. Interest rates will have to take their toll at some point, though. ADR growth is no longer bound to just the luxury segment. We are seeing strong ADR growth in all class segments. Pleasure is without a doubt the new uh, travel business travel trend, at least, for those who are extending their, their traveling into the long weekends um, and making sure that they can enjoy the city where they're in as well um, on some time off. 
And then finally, the only way for Benelux is up, at least in the short term. Thank you very much. No, Samantha, the, 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 the thanks is all, uh, all, 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 all ours to you. Really interesting. Thank you. Uh, also interesting to see, I think, the luxury market, because from, from our perspective, when we thought like, okay, what is going to happen now? We thought, well, luxury is not going to change because, I mean, these usually are not really that price sensitive, but we thought that the mid-scale would, 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 uh, would suffer. But you don't see that yet, which is very interesting. I thought it was really, really good. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, let's see if our next speaker is ready. Tim? Yeah. And everything is working as well. So that's amazing. Um, again, my name is Tim Boersma, working at Room Price Genie, um, an international uh, revenue management system uh, coming from Switzerland. Um, we now around 1,400 clients worldwide um, and still growing, luckily. And today we will all talk about the new breed of revenue management. Um, and it's more or less about being changed and uh, about changing and being changed um, and how revenue management is changed during the years and how it will change into the future. Um, so we will speak about the future, how revenue management look like in our eyes and how it started. Um, but first let's start what we hear because we speak to a lot of different hotels and hoteliers every week and the majority of them loves to work and make customers really, really happy. And they work very hard for it. However, they are facing multiple challenges as well. And we put down a few of them in here. Um, they see cost raising due to the fact that more and more people book to the OTAs and the commissions are raising. On the other hand, we see that they don't have the resources or can't do the research on their pricing. They find it really difficult. And, and they need help with it because they always think I could have done this better, especially with an event. I could have increased my prices. Um, however, it's more or less playing catch up instead of being ahead of the competition already. Um, and then what we know, and we know that 50% of the independent hotels use a PMS and 40% of the independent hotels use a general manager. However, only roughly 5% of all hotels worldwide, so not only the independent ones, use an RMS, which help them automate, automate their pricing. So what we see is that a lot, a lot of hotels still have or flat pricing or maybe seasonal pricing or by any chance lower their price at the end uh, because they need bookings in because they are empty, um, but only 5% uses an RMS. And then what guests do, and I think everyone does almost the same because we see that around 70% of all bookings are made online, which gives guests a huge advantage because they can compare rates very easy. If you go to booking.com and you click on the map, you can see the prices for the whole city in one, in one view. Um, then 85% of the people say that price is a key factor in the decision making. And because it's very easy for guests to compare, um, it's gonna be very difficult as well for the hotels to be stay competitive without using an RMS. Um, and what we see is that when you change the price by 20%, it can half or double the amount of bookings you get. And then we have a quote from Irafuk which says revenue management, in my opinion, is the item that yields the highest return on invest um, for hotel owners and operators. However, we still see that it's very difficult for hotels to get an RMS because it's too expensive. They don't know how to use it um, and multiple other factors. Then... However, what we see when someone um, gets to use an RMS, and we have only our data from our site, but when uh, people start using an RMS, we see an increase of roughly 20% in their total revenue. So it has a major impact on 
on the hotels. Um, and then here's the challenge for the independent properties, uh, because most likely it's they see it's too expensive. It requires heavy data. It's very time consuming to operate. Um, you pay a lot of setup fees, and it requires an expert to use a lot of systems. And those experts, they don't have in-house and they are too expensive to hire. And here, some challenges we see, and um, it's like Alexandra says, it's always playing catch up. And Thomas says, I, I know that I have to do it, but I don't have the time because they're doing multiple things at the same time. They're running the restaurant, they're running the, the front office, they're running everything, and then they have to do the pricing as well. So what we see a lot, is that they do have a price for a year or maybe seasonal price and they have two two prices for a year or maybe a price for a weekend and a weekday, but that's basically it. Um, and also try to imagine how difficult it can be when you don't know anything about pricing. You have to do the pricing for the next 365 days and checking your competitors, checking events, checking busy days, it's gonna consume a lot of time for a lot of different hotels and especially when you're not really into it. So prepare for the new normal of revenue management because where in the first place when you had an RMS and you are way ahead of the competition, we really believe that now it will be the other way around. Uh, when in a few years you don't have an RMS, um, you are one of the only ones and you are have a dis disadvantage compared to the ones who has an RMS because we see a lot of different prices during the year and the price difference is getting bigger and bigger, especially during events. Uh, the prices are getting way up while in the low season, the price is more or less getting lower at least to get the occupancy in. And then we see a very big increase and this is a number um, for a total one. But what we see on our side is that we have an increase of almost 40% in the Benelux. So we see an increase of 40% of hotels which requesting a demo or signing up. So more and more people getting into a revenue management solution um, when it's payable and when uh, it doesn't require that much, that much expertise from their side. So where we have revenue management before was just doing revenue management all day. Uh, with the technical aspect from nowadays revenue management systems, we see that a lot of revenue managers and between brackets only need 20 minutes a day just to, to ensure they're all on track. And they're just checking the system, how it is implementing instead of creating the system and doing the prices day by day. But don't worry, it will be for everyone. Um, because the implementation of the um, technical side is gonna help a lot. And, and that's really not human versus uh, machine. It's machine and human in one team because they both have like significant strengths where humans can be, fo can be more strategically thinking and see the correlation between two factors. Machines can focus 24 seven. They don't mind working 24 seven um, and they can update the prices and implement your strategy 24 seven a day. So when there is a change, they can implement it uh, and they will be sharp and focused during the whole period. Where for humans is really difficult. And there are many different hoteliers and many different uh, types of hotels, but there are also many different types of revenue management solutions. And we are definitely not the only one. There are many, many more. And when we see an increase between five rooms and 70 rooms, there are more revenue management systems, which are more focusing on the big properties. So there is really a revenue management system for everyone and for every type of hotel. So it's not that size matters. Um, because we see that we can implement with two rooms already. So it's really for everyone nowadays. Um, so it's not getting in line with just one revenue management system, get ahead, embrace revenue management tech. And there are many, many different ones. 
So just choose the one which is for you, but do your investigation, please. Um, and then for more sites, um, you're never too old to learn. Um, we made a book as well with 90, 49 tips um, to increase your revenue. We have an academy where you can learn more about revenue management. Um, so really get an expert in revenue management, but not spending the whole day. And then if there are any questions, please feel free. And if not, then let me click one more time. And you don't th thank you very much for for this, Tim. Um, interesting. And I, I really like the fact that you highlight the impact that revenue management can have. Uh, yes, twenty percent growth. Uh, for us, it's 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 usually just like doing small tests. Uh, try to see new things, and it's the small changes that that actually does have the 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 the, the most impact. And we like the technology also that's provided to us. So it's really good. Thank you. But without further ado, maybe let's uh, listen to what Pascal has to say. I'm Pascal Schuber from The Edge, and I'm going to speak about, well, not only online visibility, but a, a lot more. So let's jump into the subject right away, if that works. Doesn't seem to work here. Ah, there you go. Is that my first slide? Yes. So what you see on the screen, I'm, I'm, I'm digging in right away. Um, I've asked our digital marketing team to get some Google Trends uh, related on the Benelux, obviously. So on the screen is the Netherlands first. Uh, and what we can extract in order to analyze is uh, the last week, uh, the last, sorry, the last 12 weeks that we compare to the same period last year, so 2022, and also with the previous period. So I've taken uh, 12 weeks, starting the 3rd of September, 12 weeks back, and I'm analyzing the 12 weeks before that. So let's say I'm analyzing here summer versus spring, okay? And then last year also for the same period. What you see on the screen here uh, for the Netherlands is we see that the last 12 weeks, the Netherlands had 70 million demands for accommodation for the whole Netherlands, which uh, gives uh, over the last year a 4% increase and on a period versus period, so summer versus um, spring, a 7% increase. What we can see as well is which regions have increased or which regions have uh, seasonality versus a yearly traffic. So obviously North Holland with 20 million demands this last 12 uh, weeks, year over year has increased by 4%. Uh, summer versus spring has increased by 2% as well. And then you have South Holland below with 8 million, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go in through all those numbers. You will have those slides so that, that you can go in there. And if you want to discuss, I'm happy to discuss that further. If we go to the right-hand side, so demand by destination location. So here we dig a little deeper and check by, by city in the Netherlands. So the big winner again is Amsterdam with 10 million demands during those last 12 weeks. Year over year, an increase of 6%, but then we can definitely identify the seasonality within the within Amsterdam. So it has dropped by three points versus spring, okay? So you can really identify which cities have, let's say, seasonalities and which work throughout the whole year. There you go. Yes. Um, just to get back to Samantha's point, where uh, international business is, is back, and uh, yes, I confirm, but we can still see, though, that uh, obviously domestic for the Netherlands is very important, with 40 million uh, demands the last 12 months, so an increase year over year by 1%, and seasonality, 11% increase. Looking at that, we can see that international is back with almost, well, a little more than 40%. So USA, uh, Canada, India, Israel have increased year over year. Uh, I think it joins the statistics that Samantha has shown just earlier. So for sure, um, make sure to, to, to be visible um, everywhere, but those are the, the people that come back. If I move over to, there you go, to Belgium. So same analysis, 12 uh, weeks back, 20 million uh, demands for hotel accommodations, 
So year over year growth of 6%, seasonality 12% increase. So Belgium, there's three main uh, destination, I shall say. Flanders is the big winner with 10 million uh, demands and then Wallonia and Brussels. And then we can see on the right-hand side a little bit the seasonality and the year-over-year -year increase of the main cities. Brussels is the big winner, as, as mentioned earlier. Uh, spring uh, was higher this summer season, less uh, with minus three points, but year-over-year -year, an increase of 11%. And then you have all those other uh, cities that you can see where there's a big seasonality such as, and forgive me for the pronunciation, if I take Blankenberg, uh, 36% increase from spring to summer, whereas throughout the year it has dropped by 3%, which means that basically maybe the city or that place should consider some marketing to you know, promote it and get more visitors and more views and more demand. So that's what it, what it says, basically. If I look further to, oh, sorry, to uh, where the business comes from, so... Good news is that it's 50-50 for, for Belgium, so international and domestic. Still, Belgian people are still searching a lot. So 10 million, of course, it's the neighbor countries that look for, for uh, Belgium as well. But international business is still there with an increase year over year, for example, for the United States of 29%, Canada 44%, India 15%, etc., etc. et cetera. So international is definitely back for Belgium as well. If I drop now into Luxembourg, same trends. Luxembourg, much smaller country, less demand, less research. The last 12 weeks, 2 million, an increase of 12% though, and spring versus uh, summer, also an increase of 20%. Uh, so everything is green basically for, for Luxembourg. You can see Luxembourg, of course, city is, is number one in terms of, of, of demand. Uh, yet still some seasonality uh, all over, but uh, but uh, definitely a positive view. And then if we go a little deeper, obviously Luxembourg being a, a smaller country, international is very, very important, 84% uh, over the last 12 weeks. Yet again, your neighbor countries, the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, search for you. And then of course, local uh, people also search for accommodation. But then we have uh, the United Kingdom, United States, and so on, that have definitely increased over year over year, and even uh, spring versus versus summer, uh, it's also pretty high. If we look at the United States, fifty three, nothing over the summer, uh, and then the rest, Brazilians have have dropped year over year, but increased this summer, etc. So international travel is definitely back. Now this brings me all this here brings me to what is it all about at the end, right? So. Mainly it is, I would say, visibility, obviously being found and being bookable. And what we tend to say at the edge is, of course, invest on your brand. If not others, brackets, OTAs will do it. I'm taking the example, maybe not necessarily online, but here of, of buses. There's only one space on the bus. It's either you or someone else will do it. So here are the examples that you see is, is a booking.com, Expedia, et cetera, and then Airbnb, obviously, and some hotels can do it. It's a one spot but you definitely need to, to invest in your, in your brand and in your hotel to be visible and to be found and to be bookable. I had a quick question that I hope you can uh, answer. Basically, Expedia reinvests 50% of the generated revenue into their communication. So invested into search, meta search, and so on. My question to you is, do you invest the same part of your direct revenue? Yes or no? Easy question. So no, okay, um, that's, a, that's a very high number, only 6%, and then uh, most of the people don't use that. Well, then it means that uh, you're losing out against OTAs, et cetera, obviously that have, that have the, 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 the money, basically they re-inject the commission that they take from you, take 10% out of that. Let's say Expedia takes a 20% of commission, they take 20, 10%, that's to reinvest to uh you know to you to to do marketing on your name so what is important why why do i ask this question is the visibility behind is very important so here an example everybody has has seen such slides already i'm sure but just uh the eye tracker heat map on on google when you type it the name of a hotel here in this example is the new yorker hotel obviously where the people go and watch is the first three or four lines 
on their left hand side and then they go onto the google hotel ads where they will check availability click to go to the website etc if you're not there obviously you're losing out and who is there the big guys that use like expedia what they generate from you to reinvest here and to be visible and to track to get that traffic back to their website why because obviously it's easier for them to um it's easy to 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 book on their website and i can't move again there you go whoops same idea it's wrong title it's it's display uh digital um marketing on on on, on social media but same thing here for on phones and on on web for facebook and instagram where the people watch is the main information and then they they move on to to book so what we tend to say at the edge basically is first steps is make sure that you're visible throughout the entire booking journey and this by using the four pillars of the digital media so there's lots of information in here i'll try to run you through that but basically the four pillars within the digital media are in the center here is think search compare and book so the think aspect what we do in general or what you can do is pre-targeting by using display and social advertising with companies such as adroll and surgeon where you would buy content etc in order to then uh, display your uh, hotel information uh, on banner ads on newspapers that are online obviously on blogs etc etc just to put uh, your hotel brand in the head of the potential future guest mm -hmm. because they are thinking of going somewhere but they don't know where yet once they have done that, and here what we have noticed is a return on investment time, times 12 uh, by doing pre-targeting. Once they have thought they will want to search, they will search lots of hotels and do things, but one hotel may stick to their mind or two, and they will want to search it, so search marketing. As I mentioned earlier, OTAs, etc., will use their marketing stuff, marketing budget, to re-inject, to uh, invest on your property's name. Make sure to do brand protection and to uh, invest in the right keywords, not only on Google, but you have also Bing, you have Yahoo and other search engines that also generate traffic. There's not only Google. Google is the big one, but Bing and Yahoo are still relevant. Return on investment that we see on search marketing and brand protection is times 15. And then finally, once he has found your hotel and looked, etc., people will want to compare, just as Tim uh, also said. They will want to compare uh, and find the best deal. The best price you need to make sure that you have the best price by eventually using a revenue management system obviously but yes uh being there making sure that people can be redirected to your booking engine to book if you're not there obviously uh, the ota so booking expedia hotel.com etc are there and they will take the benefit of those travelers because they will bring the prices up and for them to book directly and then finally the last little piece that we can do if the customer still not, not, not finalized his booking, we can still use retargeting with display and social advertising, just with you know pushing some information on their on their social uh, channels, saying you know you have visited this website with this code, you get a discount or you get a breakfast included, whatsoever you want to you want to put online. So those four pillars are very important, but it's it's easy if you have the money to invest. What is very important that goes together with that is that you work also on your oops, conversion so optimizing your conversion it's not only the website it's not only the booking engine etc it's also it starts i would say with the website obviously so make um, the customer uh, journey on your website as easy as possible what does it mean optimize it by adding high quality content such as images the right uh, description the right keywords uh, to be found of course but also the right details that creates this i would say the wow effect when they get to your website they have a wow effect and they want to stay why because you have only 2.6 seconds to convince people are in a hurry unfortunately nowadays like on uh, whatever uh, instagram etc you can just go to the next thing it's the same here they are in a hurry you have to go fast and you have to convince quickly create opportunities for conversion create links with you know packages etc deals etc where the people can go to Second piece is, of course, the booking engine optimization. Why? Of course, as uh, Tim also said, 70% uh, of traffic comes from mobile devices. So make sure that on your booking engine is either at least responsive or mobile first. Why? Because if it's hard to navigate and see the prices, people will go and they will go somewhere else. They will go to an OTA probably where it's very easy to book via the mobile. 
create targeted packages and promotions and make it easy for them to pay. Google Pay, Apple Pay, Thai Pay, et cetera, Ideal Pay, and so on. So make sure to, to, to be in there. And then the final one that uh, is very important in our eyes as well, and what you see here is a study from H2C that they have released in 2022, where online is definitely, uh, sorry, offline is definitely as important as online. Here uh, on the screen, you can see in this little uh, chart pie, uh, or pie chart, I would say it the wrong way, 25% um, uh, of, of, of uh, distribution sales is, is, is offline. So making sure that your teams in the hotels have access to all the rates, all the promotions, the packages, et cetera, and that they can sell, send out payment links for people to easily book on a secured page is crucial. Why? Because one reservation out of four can be offline. And I think I am done. If there's any questions, please don't hesitate to pull them in the, in the questionnaire. And if not, happy to respond to you at my email. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Incredibly interesting. Also to see the, the correlation with the numbers that Samantha was, was showing. Right. Brussels is on an is on an increase. It's it's nice to see. Well, of course, I mean it's it's a trend, but it's it's nice to see it in numbers. Uh any of the listeners that are in Brussels, I think you need to check your 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 leisure prices because uh if, if demand is growing, um it's 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 very good to adapt your pricing to it. One thing that I saw actually, uh, this a small country like Denmark is quite uh, it's it's low on the on the on the list, but it is visible yes, on the list. Yes. Where okay. um, the country where I currently just like live in is is the the the, the largest country in uh, in Scandinavia, uh, but I think and they are not there, and I think it has to do with the fact that the euro is just like very 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 high for for them, so it's comes very very um, uh, expensive to travel when the Danish kroner actually is connected to the to the euro. True. Okay, but then I keep on talking, and then actually uh, I should stop talking because we That's are uh, to our next speaker, Andre. Andre, for you. Thank you so much. Awesome, perfect. So, um, as mentioned earlier already, and um, I'm going to be talking about about the impact of reviews into booking awesome perfect and we're going to start just with a simple simple saying you know happy traveling is back and i think um if all of you have read there was an announcement of the, uh, one of the largest uh, tour operators just recently who is saying actually beside inflation and beside everything that is impacting actually people's um, uh, pocket money or money uh, they have available right now Travel has never had such a high value for people across the world like it has now. So people are willing to spend money to travel. Um, it It's needed. It's needed for them personally. It's needed for them. And we heard it already um, on, the pleasure si um, on, the, on the pleasure side. So combining this business travel with the leisure side of business. And Samantha was also showing already how the market has recovered um, already. But this is also bringing us another uh, challenge, which we obviously see. Um, people want to get value for the money they spend, and they have to spend more right now. So they want to get really true uh, value on it. And Pascal mentioned as well this, uh, that properties, hotels are being comparable across the world right now. This can be um, something that can be a challenge for the success of individual properties moving forward or just now already as well. So we're seeing it's, it's people want to travel and but they're also expecting certain things. And that's where reviews are coming in um, as well on that side. And this is what we're gonna look at um, as well. And I think there's gonna be a poll on, on for you as well right now. So basically a question, what's your guess on how positive are global reviews nowadays as well? So how many reviews globally speaking are being 93% positive in 65 or in 48. So 35% already sitting at 93%, 41% are saying 65 and 48% are saying um, it is a very, very, at uh, um, uh, 24% are saying it's a very, very low figure. Awesome results. Let's look what it is actually. Uh, is it moving? It's actually 93%. So 93%. Um, of all the reviews globally have a positive 
um, are a positive feedbacks to the hotels that actually are receiving it as well. And now um, thinking of that, I, I want to ask the question also looking at the results of the polls. Looking or talking to you would be a topic also for another um, poll potentially, but we don't um, we don't do that. Every one of you hoteliers, do you like online reviews in general? When I'm thinking back, when I was a hotelier, that's that's some years ago as well, and, and looking at reviews um, as well, I didn't like it. And when we're looking at that topic, and we ask even ChatGPT, what's the relationship between business owners and online reviews? ChatGPT is very smart in giving the answer and saying it's it's a very multifaceted uh, a connection that there's existing. So really, we can see and also the result on usually on the question when I'm asking, do you like online reviews? I usually get no one to say yes, no one really. Um, it is something, and we also as a company looking at reviews, we're saying, yeah, our topic online reputation has a bad reputation in general because we're relating it to the task of having to answer to reviews in general as well. So this is something no one likes and this is very actually why, why we are seeing this, that's a negative thing. But in general, um, it's something very positive, and we're looking at 93% of all reviews are positive. It's something we should consider. So as we in general and, and hotels actually saying, hey, online reviews, that's something I don't like to talk about. I want to have a look into how other businesses are looking at reviews. So in the past, I always was presenting something how Amazon and eBay are looking at reviews and how it impacts actually um, their businesses. We're now going to have a look on, there, there has been a study of a company called Bright Local. Um, they're doing um, local business listings on Google um, as well. That's what they're specialized in. And they brought up some relevant figures that we also can learn or relate to how it's working for us in hotels. So first of all, they're saying really on local reviews, 98% are reading these reviews. When you're looking at how is that on the hotel side, over there we're sitting at a statistic of 95% currently reading reviews uh, right now. So there's still space for improvement. And as we see how other businesses are emerging, we always see that hotel will adapt and we will be coming to a higher figure in terms of um, how online reviews will, will be viewed at as well. 37% of um, people leaving reviews only do positive reviews. Only 4% of audiences are, uh, um, have never left the review and only 6% uh, of consumers only leave negative reviews. So I think this these are figures now and we see how many people are looking at reviews. It has an impact. People are informing themselves before making a buying decision. What's that product about? And if we all know Amazon booking behavior, yes, we have a look and how many reviews are there? How many of them are positive? How many is uh, negative? And we need to have these negative reviews to be an authentic uh, business provider because no one's believing in some point or someone that's just having positive reviews. Our we human beings, we are so diverse, we are so different. You never can make everyone happy. And there's always uh, the, the space for um, um, human mistakes as well. So, but looking at this right now, so we're seeing how important it is to have reviews to look at the reviews and also we are seeing actually the negative part is very tiny it's a it's a uh, it's, it's a small portion only then we want to have a look into okay now i'm hearing it's something positive so what do i do with it obviously i can also use it and pascal was already showing then you know um, boost your online visibility and, and everything and then now i want to make that's user generated content that's highly valuable for my future clients to look at as well. Now we want to see where are actually people leaving most of these reviews on. Here in this space, because we're looking at uh, uh, local business listings and um, um, Google obviously is the first one. When we are relating back to the hospitality, there's one additional player coming in place and especially in the Benelux, you know, Booking.com, actually so Google and Booking.com, they have a similar share of our total review volume globally. So there's no other player that can attract so much feedback as these two players over there. So there's no TripAdvisor doesn't do that. Holiday Check doesn't get it over there. It's Booking.com and it's Google um, who are actually the, the main um, sources where reviews are being left. And you also can see how important it is 
you always think like reviews, it's only on our topic. No, you can see it's healthcare, it's beauty, well-being, it's real estate. They all depend on, on um, reviews as well. Now we, we learned, okay, um, reviews are important and are in general positive. We want to make them available in Google because that also helps our visibility. How do we get them? How do we attract people or how do we get people or our guests to actually leave reviews on our site? And that's where you can see 34% uh, percent of the cases. It actually is done through an email and that's also the most common way to collect uh, feedback. But what's really cool, great to see here in person during the sale or during the experience. This is um, in 33% of the cases, that's something um, where you can collect a lot of feedback. And what's the, the positive aspect of that? If someone is giving you feedback while he's experiences the services, you still have the chance to actually change the experience. So if there's a negative experience, you have the chance to actually make an impact and change actually the outcome on, on that as well. That's that's actually somewhere. And then there's an easy way of collecting feedback up and check out when the invoice is being handed over there's a QR code on the invoice and then people can give feedback over there um, as well. How is that again then relating to booking behavior for the future? This is where this statistics is also giving a, a great, great impact. So um, when, for example, you as a business are making the effort to answer on reviews as well, that simply is like, I care about people buying my services and um, spending money on my side, and I give them feedback. Even if it's negative, I have to answer on it as well. But um, um, people that are seeing um, businesses are responding to reviews, to all reviews, um, um, are more likely to actually use and buy into that business as well. And you can see this green arrows, how slow they get if you don't respond to uh, reviews at all. If you're only responding to positive reviews, then the percentage of uh, people considering you um, for their own needs is also a little bit less. It gets, um, it gets relevant when you start to actually at least uh, respond to negative reviews on the, on the journey as well. And this is something now that's crucial for our businesses. There's a minimum expectations on the customer side in any businesses that you have. And we are talking about the one to five um, scale. You can see here starting four stars, that's where it's get relevant and people start um, looking at uh, buying into your services, relating that to hotel side. Um, and, and we're talking also about the one to five scale if you're below four stars, you might be deselected in many cases. And we're talking about 50, 60% over there. It's the minimum requirement that um, people are looking and when, when they're looking at what kind of services I wanna, wanna receive. Um, so really you get deselected and booking.com is confirming that in a lot of studies, you get deselected when you um, are three stars and below um, over there um, as well. What do consumers, and this is also something we, we talked about, reviews are user-generated content that you should make available on Google, and but it's also possible to actually make that available on your own website because it keeps people on your website and it keeps converting on your website directly again. And that's where you want to get the business from. And here's just a little bit of an insight. What kind of content would be interesting um, when, when you're actually doing, um, when, when you're doing that? And again, also then the, the the way to collect that as well. Again, it's mail, it's personal um, um, interaction with the guests so on site, but also then at the time when it, people are checking out and giving a, um, um, an invoice. Stepping back to the hotel industry, and this is what we actually want to wanna showcase. It can be helpful and it can be crucial nowadays with all this competition and increased prices um, in, in the market um, that you actually create an experience platform or your experience guest experience feedback um, solution for yourself to collect feedback at multiple steps and evaluate at the end what is marketing actually setting and expectations when they promote your product and what's actually the feedback at the end. And obviously, if the feedback is very, very positive in the end, you can say, okay, marketing can be even more aggressive and ask for more money from the beginning already. So that's there's a gap, there's, a, um, there's an opportunity revenue that's sitting in there by evaluating what I guess they're expecting and what's the actual services you're providing. 
um, over there. When we're looking at uh, results for the EMEA region, uh, what's the most important for hotels, uh, for guests nowadays um, in, in the second quarter, um, we can say that service, hotel and location is still the, 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 the most uh, the most positive uh, aspect that uh, people are giving. What's still the most challenging one, and that's uh, you can see in the situation with competitiveness and this is also showing that price, Wi-Fi, that forever has been one of the challenges and the room product is also something that's being evaluated. We're talking about the um, the um, the Benelux um, right now as well. And here's some statistics just showing on how reviews are being given in cities like Rotterdam, Brussels, and Amsterdam. You can see the, vo the volume clearly is dependent also on the volume of hotels over there. Um, you can see, and yeah, these presentations will be shared with you after this webinar, um, the performance, how different it can be, but you also can see how important the location cleanliness, but also this is kind of critical, I would say, how cleanliness is being rated in these cities right now as well. Um, maintenance, also one of the challenges, and food and, uh, um, and still actually being something very, very important right now, um, but still being challenged from guests, and most critical one still is um, Wi-Fi indeed. That's something needs to look at. Interesting will be for every one of you, here's an, um, a screenshot of um, Amsterdam, for example, what's impacting Amsterdam figures the most, um, who are some of the uh, properties that are receiving most of the reviews in that city. Um, we've got the same here for Brussels also, um, what's impacting the score in general, but who is also receiving the biggest amount of uh, reviews. You can see there's a big gap in terms of the volume over there and the same for Rotterdam um, in, in here as well for you to look at um, later. So when looking at this, we actually saying that reviews not only have an impact on you being booked and getting booked at the, the best rate uh, that you should deserve as well, but it's also, it's a data um, source right now. A data source is giving you indication what you're strong at, what are people looking at when they go to your property? So what do you need to focus on as well? And then you just, um, again, coming back to Pascal, you make it comparable. You want to be, you want to outpace your, your competitors. And this is what can be done as well. And platforms like us, so you're comparing your own data versus brands versus local competitors, or potentially against destination data as well. That's possible to do um, over there um, as well. Coming back to that question, uh, do you like online reviews? And I still, I hope looking at it has an impact on uh, on booking on the bookings you're receiving, but also it's giving you a lot of data that you potentially need for your future uh, development. But also, I said as well, we don't like online reviews because it relates to one task that actually has to do with answering on the reviews. And now I, I brought up ChatGBT in there, but also this is something that is solved nowadays. We also have technology answering on reviews nowadays. And that's actually actually should push us to actually get our topic to actually be in a little bit more positive received moving forward and we can make use out of that as well. Happy to answer questions on this as well or get some feedback over there, but thank you for the time, Anna Maria. Thank you very much for your time, uh, Andre. And yeah, you touched uh, on, a, on a point uh, we see the very uh, a close correlation to just like hotels going just like on booking.com mostly under eight uh, we see it immediately in the amount of bookings that they receive but also in the, in the, in, the, in the price that we can ask for interesting thank you so much andre we have one speaker left it's olivier olivier i hope that you are ready sure i am thank you uh, anna marie um, well, during the preparation of uh, this session, um, it took me some time to decide what uh, kind of statistics uh, from the Benelux market uh, I could uh, share with you. Um, and as we are currently focused on cell service guest journey, um, I thought I will bring a few numbers from our guest stay module, which is a guest experience application on the guest platform. Uh, see if it's works yep okay um in this graph um, is showing the adoption of online check-in on a kiosk um and i often show this graph to uh, hoteliers 
uh, when they bring the conversation to the objection that their guests are not ready for self-service. And to be honest, when I saw this graph for uh, the very first time, I was a little bit surprised myself as well, because at first I thought uh, it's something for the, the young generation who is using a kiosk. Uh, but when looking to these figures, I see that uh, the older generation, like myself, uh, is using, using the kiosk during the check-in um, as well. Our guests are using self-service already, and um, there is no need to educate them on benefits. Uh, just think about going to the fast food uh, restaurant where we use the kiosk, uh, going to the supermarket uh, where we use the self-service uh, scanning system, uh, going to the gas station where we pay at a pin and chip terminal, uh, and when traveling by plane uh, on the day before uh, departure online check-in. But in fact, self-service is much more than a uh, kiosk, although those comes naturally first uh, to our uh, mind. Uh, but just think about Netflix or when we, I'm not sure, perhaps only for the men, but when we are looking for a new car, uh, I use the online car configurator online. Or what about travel search? Um, when was the last time you called a travel agency asking for recommendation of a hotel in the city you traveled uh, to? Uh, when did you ask the travel agency to make this booking in that hotel? Let me take you quickly through the self-service guest journey in hospitality. The guest is looking for a hotel in the city where you are located. The guest is finding his way on the web and finds your beautiful website. He likes the images, the description of your hotel and reads only positive reviews. Your guest starts making an online reservation and the look and feel from your booking engine is perhaps the same as the look and feel from your hotel website. So the guest hardly sees he is landing in another website. The reservation goes quick and smoothly, and after a few seconds, the guest receives a confirmation of the booking. Your PMS sends a week, sends a week upon arrival, a pre-arrival letter email mentioning the possibility of leaving the luggage when arriving early and when the room is not ready yet. Two days upon arrival, the guest receives a pre-registration form asking to check profile and reservation details and asking for a digital signature. Two days upon arrival, the guest receives a pre-registration form asking uh, to check profile and reservation details and ask for a technical signature. The guest arrives at your hotel and finds a line at the reception, but sees a check-in kiosk. In a few seconds, the guest is checked in, has paid the booking in advance and received his key card. During the stay, the guest can order drinks and food using a QR code for ordering and pay. At the day of uh, checkout, your guest receives an email with an overview of the outstanding balance and a link to pay online. From his own device, the guest pays the outstanding amount and automatically receives the invoice by email. And the last stage, a few days after checkout, the guest receives an email asking for, hopefully, a positive review. From the guest point of view, the overall experience should be smooth. Stay information should be correct, dates, booked rate, attractions, etc. Payment should be secure and brand consistency. To provide this level of confidence, there is a lot happening at the background of the system. And let, let, let me give you one example. In the search and reservation stage, correct rate and availability needs to be sent from the PMS to your booking engine and from there to Google. 
when the guest selects the data and rate from there, he expects to see exactly the same information when landing in the booking engine. After the reservation is completed, all the details should be securely stored in PMS, including payment details. And this goes the same for each step in the guest journey I showed you before. All of the processes mentioned before can be done within Guestline platform, but that does not mean that hotels cannot use third-party solutions. Actually, they should, like brand reputation managers, management from TrustPay, TrustU, sorry, Andre, revenue management from Room Price Genie, and digital marketing from The Edge. We from Gasline are integrated with these great brands and over 500 other vendors. That should be more than enough to create sufficient tech stack. The choice is on the hotelier's side. I want to give you three home takeaways. First, do more with less. You can go for 50 best of breed solutions to manage your hotel business. But will you actually use all the features those solutions offer? Will your staff have time to follow all the updates and new features? Most probably you could get the same result with 10 centralized solutions and your accounting will thank you for that. It's much easier to manage 10 accounts than 50. Secondly, you can't say self-service is not for your hotel as you will not know it before you try. Guest expectations are changing fast, sometimes faster than we think. An early adapter story where 10 minutes after we installed our kiosk and we were sitting in the lobby discussing how to make guests aware of how to use it, a guest came in, in the lobby, head straight to the kiosk, checked in and went upstairs. How easy can it be? And at last, third point, self-service solutions will not take receptionist jobs. Actually, it will give them time to be real hosts and no guest data administrators anymore. There is much more to talk about self-service guest journey. That's why Guestline put together a guide which helps hoteliers to understand opportunities related to it. Guest line, your key to more. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Olivier. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because a lot of times we hear it for, uh, still from hotels like, okay, we don't want to have like an, um, an online check-in because we want to have communication with our guests. And I think you touch on a very important part. You, you do communicate and you do have staff that, that does actually have the time to communicate, communicate much better. Checking in is about the most boring part of, of, of a visit at a hotel. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't think we have that much time for a panel discussion. <clears throat> I think that closes off the webinar for today. Um, I hope you had an, an enjoyable hour and 15 minutes around. Uh, we have our next webinar on the 5th of October. We do that under the brand name Revenue Forum. And there we have like a focus, uh, the, the um, uh, topic rev focus shift from revenue management to profit management. Speakers from uh, Frontline Performance Group, NetAffinity, Sendline, Tacticon, and more. Uh, and I hope you can, uh, can join there um, as well. Last but not least, uh, on the 30th of January, it's time again for our Global Revenue Forum. This is a unique and hybrid event held simultaneously in Stockholm, London, Milan, and Lisbon, as well as online. It's a day full of fantastic speakers, panels, interviews, workshops, and more. Um, and, well, you can go to globalrevenueforum.com to book. And that was all from us for today. Hope to meet you uh, on our next webinar or one of our seminars, events, or just like anywhere around Europe. Thank you very much to, you, to our speakers for your inspiration. I found it very enjoyable. Thank you also for my colleague, Johanna Lien, uh, for handling the slides and handling all the pra practical details. But most of all, thank you all for listening.